I'm Jonah Miller, the chef and owner of Huertas Restaurant in the East Village. We're a Spanish restaurant, and today I'm making a dish uh, that I had for the first time actually last summer in the south of Spain. We tend to focus on the cooking of northern Spain, of, of the Basque region, and also a bit of Catalonia, but I uh, stayed abroad in Madrid, so the, the sort of um, inspiration for the name of the restaurant is the street that I lived on called Calle Huertas in the center of Madrid, and it's uh, in the old part of town in the Barrio de las Letras. To give you an idea of how old it is, the building next to where I lived is the building where Cervantes lived when he wrote Don Quixote. So I've always been really attracted to the kind of uh, historic you know, dishes in Spain, all the, the history. In New York here, if it's a restaurant for you know, 10 years, it's a great run, 20, 30 years, but there's really only a handful of restaurants in New York that have been open for 100 years. And if you walk down the streets of Madrid and, and most towns in Spain, you'll find you know, dozens of restaurants that have been there for hundreds of years serving lots of the same sorts of foods. So I think it's a dish that, that qualifies um, as one of those historic dishes, but it's one that I hadn't come across because Spain, you know, like many countries, is very regional. So this is something called chicharrones de Cadiz, uh, pork belly from Cadiz. Cadiz is way down in the south uh, on the, the west tip, and you can sort of you know, see the Strait of Gibraltar, or see the rock of Gibraltar. It's right on the Strait of Gibraltar, and you can see Africa. And I wasn't in Cadiz, but I was in Malaga, which is close by, and, and Cadiz is sort of the, one of the food capitals of the region. Sherry comes from that area, and um, I ate in a bunch of restaurants that serve this dish. So once you start seeing something on, on more than one menu, you, you feel as if you have to try it. And it's a really unusual dish because it's pork belly, but it's not crispy, it's not smoked, uh, it's not braised, uh, and it's ultimately served sort of room temperature, like charcuterie or you know, cured meat, and this is be lightly cured, and it's finished with good olive oil over the top of it. And that's why I wanted to cook, serve it today and to make it and show you guys how to make it. It's also an easy thing to prepare at home. I think pork belly can be a little intimidating to cook at home sometimes. You know, certainly it's a fatty cut, which, um, you know, maybe will uh, you know, detract from your desire to cook it at home, thinking that you want to be healthy, but this is good fat. Um, just the way that olive oil is good fat, these are good pigs, and I think it's a dish that allows you to really taste the pork and you know, understand that this fat has great flavor to it. And unlike something like bacon, we're not going to be rendering all this fat out. So you're not going to eat tons of it. It's something where you have a few slices to sort of start the meal and whet your appetite. Uh, so let's begin. We have a pork belly, and we've been using pork belly at where it does these red wattle pigs from, uh, I believe these are from Missouri, but the, originally the breed is from Louisiana. And we've been making bacon for, for 10 years now, where we take bellies like this one, and we cut them into about two pound chunks and we cure them for a few days. So typically bacon might take seven days to cure, but because we're not curing the whole belly, um, so instead of curing the whole belly, which might take a week or more, we cut them into smaller, smaller pieces and then we cure them sort of aggressively with uh, a spice mix, which we'll talk about in a moment, and we wrap them in plastic wrap and we press them and put them in the fridge. So we're gonna do that, but we're not gonna cure it as aggressively because we're not making bacon and we're not gonna smoke it afterwards. But uh, we are going to start the same way by cutting this in. So I have a, a glove here. And this is, I believe, a seven pound piece of pork. So we're going to try to make about a two pound section here. So um, you can see that there's obviously a lot of fat because it's belly. But what you're hoping to find when you're buying pork belly at the store is that, you know, there's a, a nice balance between the fat and lean meat. So not necessarily marbling, but that when it's cooked out, you get those streaks the way that you might in bacon. So for purpose of the demo, let's pick what looks like maybe the best one. So you can see how there's, there's nice streaks of, of lots of fat and then the leaner meat. And we'll put this aside. And here we have our cure. So this is a lot of salt and a little sugar, which is unusual for curing pork belly. Typically bacon is more sugar than salt but this is actually five parts salt and one part sugar. And we use dextrose at Huertos, which is basically super fine sugar that's often used when you're, you're curing or you know, making sausages because it dissolves quite quickly. But you can use regular granulated sugar at home that'll work perfectly well. But the ratio here, again, it's a little unusual. It's five parts salt to one part sugar. And because there's so much salt in it, it's gonna have a, a sort of quicker impact than it would if there was more sugar. It's gonna draw the moisture out of the, the pork more quickly. And then with our seasoning, we've sort of seasoned that. So we've added black pepper and sweet pimenton, sweet paprika. And those are, are not gonna have a big impact on how it cures, the speed and sort of balance of it, but they're adding flavor. So 
you don't need to have an exact quantity, but let's say for, for five ounces of salt and one ounce of sugar, it's a couple tablespoons of cracked black pepper and a couple tablespoons of pimentone. From there, you could add more seasonings, more flavors if you'd like. So I'm just gonna take a couple of bay leaves. You could use fresh ones or dry ones and kind of break them up a bit. Um, if you wanted to use garlic, you could do that, but I, you'd wanna make sure that we sort of smash it and integrate it to the salt really well so there's not just pockets of garlic sitting in one spot or another. Some oregano. Um, I really like fresh oregano. I think it uh, is a, an herb that works all kinds of, all times of year. You know, sage is something that to me is like a Thanksgiving spice. I only use that in the fall and the winter. Um, but things like oregano and thyme can you know, work equally well in the, in the summer, um, adding a bit of savoriness to a fresh dish. You know, even just some, some fresh oregano or thyme over a tomato salad takes it in a very different direction than say basil would. So I'm just kind of gonna massage this in. Uh, you know, if you were really planning ahead as you might in a restaurant, you might let that sit you know, in the fridge for a couple days to allow the bay leaf to really soak into the salt. There's no need to do that at home. I would never do it at home. I think sometimes, you know, the difference between restaurant cooking and home cooking is that we're, you know, purposely thinking several steps ahead. But the way a restaurant chef cooks at home is not the way that they cook in their restaurant. A lot of the steps I would take in a restaurant because people are, you know, paying money and, and it's on us to make it a, a level that's elevated away from what you would do from home. But the same way I don't do those sort of fussy things at home, there's no reason that a home cook would either. And we're gonna take our plastic wrap and uh, get it so you guys can see. Great big plastic wrap. This is one advantage that in a restaurant kitchen we have nice large sheets of plastic wrap that you're not gonna have at home, but you can do it with whatever you have. And I'm just gonna sort of lay down uh, a layer, a single but you know aggressive layer of seasoning that's about the same size as our piece of pork belly, and then pop it right on top, and then again, aggressively season it. And you see it's not on the side so much, that's okay. But do your best as you wrap it up to have it sort of hit the sides as this one's doing here. And folding it up, wrapping it. Okay, so now pretty evenly coated. It's not sitting in an abundance of seasoning, but it's very heavily seasoned. And then we would take that and we can put that onto you know, a plate or a tray or something, something like this. And then here we have our, our heritage uh, bacon weights, but some sort of weight and put it in the fridge with a little bit of weight on top of it. And something like this, I would leave for, for a day or two. Um, two days is sort of the max. And obviously it's gonna be a little more of an impact uh, having it two days than, than a single day. But in either case, it's gonna draw some moisture out of it. So you wanna have it sitting in a container or a plate that if there's any, any juices that come out of it, that they're gonna be caught. And after those two days, you'll notice that the, the texture of the meat has really firmed up. And it almost might feel like a, a cooked piece of meat. And that's because you've, you've kind of lightly cured it. And, and if you're curing pork or meat, it might take you know, days or weeks. Whereas if you said you know, a piece of gravlax or fish, after six or eight hours, you'd see a lot of that start to come out of it. So this um, would get rinsed after those, those couple days and dry it off nicely so that there's no residual water on it. And then we would put it on a rack, uh, on a sheet tray like this and into an oven. And this is the part of the recipe that I had to play with the most because we make bacon at Huertas and I sort of knew how the curing process would go. But when we make the bacon with the same pork bellies and it's the same size, we then smoke it and we smoke it at uh, in an oven that we can control the temperature, but there's wood chips in there. So I know exactly how long I like to cook our bacon for. And we cook that for about 30 minutes at 325. So it's, you know, it's cooked through, it could be eaten like that. But then when we use their bacon and we use it in our fried rice dish, we cut it into lardons and we crisp it up. So it's a very sort of traditional way to, to eat pork belly. But what I was going for here is something different, something that was, uh, you know, going to be served room temperature or cold and, um, the recipes that I was looking at all sort of had a very short cook time at a low temperature, which didn't make sense to me, but um, I tried them. And what I settled on was 250 for an hour and a half. So after that time, not much of the fat has rendered out. And we're gonna pretend that that's all happened. And I'm gonna pull the, the one that we've finished out and we're gonna slice that and taste it with the olive oil. So a day or two in this cure in the refrigerator, rinsed off, dried, and then right into a preheated 250 degree oven. You don't need any olive oil or any further seasoning on it. If you have a, a rack that you can put it on in your sheet tray, that's gonna help with whatever fat does drip out of it. 
out of the oven and cooled down. So that's an important step. After it's roasted, it needs to cool down um, so it can sort of tighten up so it can actually be sliced. And also, you know, that's the way in which we want to eat. This is not ice cold, not straight from the refrigerator, but again, like any sort of meat or cured meat or salami, you want to eat it about room temperature. And particularly because there's so much fat in here still, although there's less than there was before it was roasted, you, know, you want that fat to be room temperature. So this has been out of the fridge for about an hour. You know, it's a great dish for picnics or for entertaining because you take it out, you can even slice it a couple hours ahead of time, maybe lay a paper towel or parchment over it after it's been sliced. And when people show up or when you get to the park, you, you just you know, pull it out. Uh, we're gonna serve it with a bit of lemon, um, some picos, which are Spanish breadsticks. You could use you know, any kind of breadstick, a grassini with sesame seeds would be totally uh, appropriate as well. You could serve it with baguette or crackers. Uh, the olive oil, of course, and then we'll taste it and see if it needs a little bit of salt to finish, but that's another indication, if it does, that it's not nearly as you know, heavily seasoned or aggressively uh, seasoned as, say, um, baking would be, which would cure longer. So we're gonna start with a knife. The best way to do this is on a meat slicer. In Spain, um, it's actually not uncommon to see slicers on people's kitchen counters and homes, so they can you know, slice their jamón or their salchichón but you can definitely use a knife. If you're using a knife, you're trying to get the thinnest slice possible. Uh, I'm doing this on top of uh, some parchment just because I did, uh, with this one, add a little bit of pimenton before it was roasted. So it's got a bit of a, uh, a crust on it. Not a uh, hard crust, but one that, that would rub off on the board and just make it harder to clean. So if you're slicing with a knife, you, know, you can get a thin slice, um, but it's not gonna be quite as uniform as you would with a slicer but as thin as possible would be something, something like this. And I'll give it a taste now and just decide whether it's gonna need salt before we finish it. And here we go. Um, I can handle just a little bit of salt, which is kind of where I like to be because a flaky salt like this will add a little texture too. So it doesn't necessarily need a lot of help, but a little more salt will give you those sort of bursts of flavor as well. Um, so we'll do a few by hand and then we'll switch the slicer. And whenever I saw this served in Spain, it was always served on sort of wax paper, butcher paper. Um, so that's what we're gonna do today. And if you, you did wanna serve it at home and, and have it ready to go before your guests arrived, it's ideal sort of to have it sandwiched between a couple layers of parchment paper so that it doesn't dry out. And then you can just pull the top one off as your guests arrive. All right, so we'll do three by hand and then and switch the slicer here. The first slice on a meat slicer is it's kind of like the first pancake or the first crepe where you're sort of nailing the, the heat of the pan here. I'm not quite sure how thick we want it to be, but let's give it a, a go. All right, so you can see maybe a little, little too thin. We'll crank it up a bit. Here we go. All right, dramatic end of the, uh, the rotating blade. So you can see with the slicer, it's a little bit thinner and allows you sort of to, to drape it a bit. In Spain, they probably might not even be so fussy. They'd have it all just, lying uh, with no height straight on the plate. And to finish it, there's not much to do, but we're gonna take a lemon. And whenever there's a dish that I see served with a lemon, I like to taste it without the lemon first and, and then get in there and squeeze it. Um, so that's the way that, that we'll taste it today. We'll just trim the top and bottom off a bit. And just get a, a nice wedge here. All right, knock them out. And then, a nice glug of this oil. So I haven't tried this combination yet. I'm looking forward to it, but um, again, it is, it's kind of bizarre to think about olive oil on top of pork fat, um, but I, th I think it'll be harmonious here. And hopefully the, you know, the, uh, that bitter finish of the oil will pair really well with the pimenton, which is slightly smoky. The, the pork is almost sweet, actually. I mean, it's not aggressively sweet. There's only a little bit of sugar in there, but I think uh, it will we'll match well. A little bit of the salt, 
and then these pico. So the idea is when you eat it, you're kind of wrapping one of the uh, slices of the chicharron around a pico, so a little bit of lemon, kind of running it through the olive oil and, and giving, it a, giving it one nice bite. All right, so let's go without the lemon first, and the move here is to wrap it around one of the picos and grab some extra oil. Pico, what are you saying is pico? These guys, picos is what I've always heard them the referred bread to, stick? yeah, the bread. I've never heard that word. Hmm. Sometimes I think reganos I've seen, but um, you see them on every, almost every plate of jamon and yeah, manchego. Sure. And, and definitely, I think I'm, I'm tasting a lot of the, like, the back bitterness of the olive oil is balancing mm -hmm. out. Uh, and if you, when you find these, if you can find them, sometimes they're not so great. Uh, but the ones that are made with olive oil, as opposed to just whatever other oil, and all it is is water, flour, and olive oil. So, um, like all these simple things, the quality of the, of the breadsticks matter too. Should we give it a little lemon and see, yeah. uh, see how it changes things? Um, it has a very nice balance of the, the sweetness mm, of the pork. It does come through, like you mentioned. And it, it's kind of a, a, I mean, I think, um, you know, at Huertas, our job is very much to be an interpreter and understanding what's going to work for Americans. This is not something we have on the menu, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll give it a try now that we've done it, but I think it's a, it's a dish that might be challenging in terms of, like, your expectations of, of what pork belly is, and having uh, something that's fatty like this and not crispy and cold is not typical in American cooking, but you would see something like in Spain. I think it, it allows you to taste the pork a lot more than you would if it were still sizzled up in a pan or thrown into a deep fryer. Um, and likewise, you can taste the oil even more than you might with something like salad greens that might actually have more kind of a, a sharper flavor and more texture than, than you would with the pork. I'm crazy for that. Man, oh man, is that wonderful. Um, you know, the exercise of having to think of the right thing, the right pork dish to, to serve with amazing olive oil um, prompted me to try something new that I'd eaten but never made before. And uh, yeah, exciting success. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So you, you, can find, uh, you can find me and you can find Huertas in the East Village where we always have heritage pork belly as bacon in our fried rice, which is sort of a, a bit of a signature dish. And uh, now we'll have to consider some cold or room temperature pork belly, some chicharron uh, for the menu coming up soon.